welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Greetings, listeners. I'm Rhonda Chervin, and I have with me today the co-author of a book that we wrote together that has a special meaning right now. Um, my co-author, Al Hughes, who is a lieutenant colonel and then a past in the, in the Air Force and then a pastoral minister and spiritual director, and myself, Rhonda Chervin, professor of philosophy and author of many books on spirituality, In any case, we wrote this book a couple of years ago, but now it has a special meaning because we're doing this program precisely at, we hope, the end, but maybe just the middle of the corona scare. And so many people are anxious who aren't even usually that anxious. So we're hoping that our show will show how we move through this book toward escaping anxiety along the road to spiritual joy. So now, one of my joys in working on this book was um, that Al Hughes happens to have come from Louisiana and had a childhood full of experience in those alligator swamps, which those of us who come from places like New York City could never imagine even seeing. And in a few minutes, I'm going to have let you listen to the chapter head, which used the experience of the swamp as a metaphor for anxiety. But one more point about the nature of this book. It started in this way, that um, coming to Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, to retire there, and meeting Al Hughes, who was previously at a writer's group of mine, he noticed that I was very anxious, especially because he could see me picking at my fingernails constantly, incessantly, which I didn't even realize I was doing. And so since he's a spiritual director, um, he suggested that maybe he could help me with problems of anxiety. And when he started working with me, I thought that what he said was so insightful that it would make a very interesting book to have an actual, an actual book giving the advice of a spiritual director, in this case to me, but that would be useful for many others as well. And so, um, but first, before we get into the themes of the book, uh, Al, would you just read off for us the chapter head so that people can see how interesting this was, this, to see anxiety as like a swamp. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it, it reminds me, too, uh, I grew up in New Iberia, Louisiana, way down there, and I always characterized that town as the last high ground between the swamp and the marsh. Um, so... <laughs> That was my upbringing in that in that environment. Uh, the um, the metaphor I use throughout the book is uh, is that anxiety is like a dismal swamp, a dismal swamp, and indeed that's the title of the first chapter. Which actually we call it sessions, but uh, the first session title is anxiety, the dismal swamp. Second session is. Uh, Entering the swamp, which is the anxiety that that uh, Rhonda exhibited, uh, entering the swamp in uh, first attempts at uh, working with her. Uh, the next session was the swamp at dusk, dark, troubled waters. And at this was the first time I really saw Rhonda in action. She uh, exploded in anger during that session, and that in itself was quite instructive. Uh, Session four is called Turmoil on False Bayou, which uh, continued some of the turmoil that uh, uh, Rhonda was going through, uh, because along with her anxieties, which had been historic for most of her life, 
Uh, she was also concerned about her daughter, who seemed to be dying of lymphoma at the time. Uh, miraculously, that has been cured, but um, at the time, it was at the top of uh, Rhonda's anxiety list for sure. Uh, session five, running amuck in the muck, I made a startling discovery there that Rhonda was stuck in partially in the early teen years psychologically, in that she thought everything that was she saw and heard was about her. We all go through that in the early teen years, but she was stuck there. Session six, uh, Roots in the Shallows. We came to a tentative idea of um, what her problem was, uh, but by session seven, I realized we had pushed a little too hard. We, we uh, In session seven, we actually found uh, the bitter root, and we'll explain what that is in a few minutes. The bitter root, deep waters, is session seven. Se session eight is, is that a tree limb or a snake? Uh, this was a time of great uncertainty for Rhonda as she was trying to struggle with the meaning of the bitter root that we had found and not yet able to overcome it. Session nine, snake in the boat. <laughs> Excuse me, that was when uh, I think Rhonda uh, had her last explosion of anger, and it was a doozy. It was uh, it was a classic 79-year-old woman exploding like a terrible two toddler. It was uh, something to behold, but, uh, and again, it turned out to be uh, the last uh, ex explosion of anger that I've seen in her of any magnitude. At that point, uh, I wrote an interlude called Open Waters, Where Are We?, that summarized where we were at the point. Session 10, by then I could see the whole picture of Rhonda's issue, so I wrote The Castle of the Swamp Queen, The Castle of the Anxiety Queen, if you will. And when Rhonda read that, it was like, it was like looking at a mirror. And uh, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, a little bit later. Session 11, Sunrise Over the Swamp. Things are getting better for Rhonda, and sun is spelled S-O-N rather than S-U-N. Sunrise Over the Swamp. Session 12 was Customs of the Swamp Dwellers, which was kind of a review and of uh, her, some of her journaling, which was uh, very instructive to me. Session 13, Lost River and the Way Back, uh, and then 14, Rounding Bayou Bend, and 15, From the Top of the Levee. Those last three uh, indicate the real progress that Rhonda was making in overcoming her lifelong anxieties. So that's now, it, 15 just, sessions. Now, just as I'm listening to Al Hughes, who's a, still a dear friend of mine and spiritual director of mine, <laughs> I remember that angry thing, and it's related to one of the main important points one of the main important aspects of our work together is this thing that what's called, what Al Hughes calls the bitter root judgment behind the anxiety, which is some traumatic thing in childhood. It could be not just one incident, but a whole relationship, that bitter relationship. But where something something goes on which leads the child to this lifelong feeling that I'm this or I'm that, in my case, that I'm going to be rejected by father figures or male figures, okay? And I'll get into that a little bit more later. But one of the aspects of this, these angry outbursts is something that since my, I thought that my father, who I thought rejected me, I thought he was kind of smug. I think many of us don't go to spiritual direction, which could help us very much. We don't go or for any kind of help with our problems because we see the person who would be giving us advice as smug as smug. That is smug in the sense of feeling 
this is very simple. Just do what I say and you'll be fine like me. I'm perfect and you're, you're you know, a poor, weak, awful person, see? But that's all part of the syndrome, see? It all fits in with the syndrome. And in fact, it took me a long time to actually believe that Al Hughes was as full of spiritual joy as he said he was because that seemed to me as if you've arrived, he's arrived and I haven't, that kind of thing. So anyway, but before going into that fear of rejection that's behind that anger, um, I want to ask Al to explain to you what he means by this concept of the bitter root judgment underlying anxiety. Sure. Uh, I'm going to go first back to uh, my training as a spiritual director. Abbott David, who was uh, leading the team training us, uh, used to say that a very young child is an excellent observer, but a very poor interpreter, meaning that they see and hear everything. And if you've been a parent, you know that. But they have not lived enough light, life to... Uh, be able to understand the totality of what's going on. So when they see something that they believe is negative, they often will de will decide that they are somehow at fault, and they come to this understanding, false but but deep, that somehow it's their fault and they are wrong or, or they are at fault in some way uh, because they, at, at a very young age, they haven't really discovered other people as persons, uh, so they blame themselves. Um, and these negative self-assessments of the very young child uh, get uh, wrapped up in their subconscious and they're liable to live with that that self negative self judgment for much of their life without knowing it's there. Um, let's see. For uh, for instance, um, in my own case, growing up, uh, my father was a good man. Uh, you know, he, he was faithful to my mother. Uh, kept beans on the table and a roof over our head, but he was very distant from his children. Uh, there was never any, well, we call it today quality time. There was no such thing then, at least in, in our family. And so I grew up with a bitter root judgment that I, he didn't like me, and it must be because I was physically ugly. And that stayed with me all the way into my mid-20s. Uh, and so the result being that because I was ugly, in my own estimation, I uh, avoided dating uh, when I should have been out dating, and I just withdrew more often than not from any social uh, uh, intercourse with, with my uh, fellow students in school. Uh, the bitter root judgment, if it's not checked, can, uh, can haunt you for your entire life. So you know, knowing before, as we... Before you knowing go further, as, now, just describe that scene because that was so poignant to me, that scene where you would be wanting to sit at his feet. Um, you would be wanting to sit, sit at his feet doing um, your oh, homework. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm in uh, grade school, for instance, uh, late grade school, maybe fifth, sixth grade, somewhere around there. And I would, uh, in the evening, I would collect my homework, my books and my notes, and I would sit at my father's feet while he was reading the newspaper and uh, when he turned the page he would notice me and immediately send me to my rooms and he would say so that you can study well I was studying and but I'm an extrovert and when uh, he sends me into isolation in uh, 10 or 15 minutes I would shut down go to bed often crying to bed and uh, it was totally totally uh, uh, unproductive to send me to my room, but he didn't understand, and I think it's because he almost certainly was a strong introvert, 
he thought I had to be alone so I could study. It was just the opposite. So that, of course, not only uh, uh, not only inhibited my studies at times, but it also uh, convinced me that I must be ugly. So then you see that, you would get into this anxiety without even realizing it, that when he was with other people, he would assume, usually wrongly, that they didn't like him because he was ugly, and so he would it would make him anxious if he tried to be friends with people. You know, he would just withdraw and, you know, that kind of thing. So um, this is very important, this idea of looking into the bitter root judgment. If you try to watch your own anxiety, the most extreme forms of it, Somehow it comes back to the feeling, some feeling from your childhood. So the one that I realized I was always working with is that because my father, who wasn't married to my mother but was living with my mother in a common law marriage, because he left when we were eight years old, I always, I had this feeling of being rejected by male authority figures because He married another woman who had a beautiful young teenage daughter, and I was an awkward eight-year-old. So somehow this feeling carried all through my life in the form of being very angry at men very easily if they just before they would get to reject me, (laughs) then sometimes causing them to reject me because I was so angry all the time but also like an extreme of anxiety where even if I was in a, uh, in a job, like a job as a professor, say, if the head of the school happened to pass by and didn't smile at me, I would immediately assume I'm going to be fired the next day. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. So that's how this bitter root judgment Men will re- men in authority will reject me, or men in general will reject me. And actually, years later, when I got back close to my father in the last 20 years of his life, um, I realized he really did love me all the time. It was just that he wasn't um, he wasn't a teddy bear type of man. His idea of love was to teach you things, not to hug you or have fun with you, that kind of thing, you know. So anyway, so once we came to get, once you get to the thing of seeing what is underlying this anxiety, then you can begin to look for remedies or healing of that anxiety. But let's just look for a moment at the corona situation right now. And Al, what would you say? What, what would you say was the bitter root judgment underlying the fear of it? Do you think it's just rational concern because it's a deadly virus, or do you think there's something more going on in most people? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I know factually, uh, particularly if you look at what's going on in Italy, uh, they did not take action. Uh, right away uh, when this uh, started and uh, and that maybe say something about the Italian character I don't know but uh, but uh, I hear now that uh, among the elderly who have it 20 percent are dying that's pretty high Uh, so that's that's the you know that's what I think uh, the nation here is trying to avoid Uh, as to whether there's an underlying um, a bitter root, I don't know. You'd have to talk to the individuals. Um, I don't know that there's such a thing. I don't think there's such a thing as a, uh, as a global or a uh, society-wide uh, bitter root judgment. It all depends on the, uh, the, uh, what happened to the individuals during their childhood. Okay, well, now let me give a theory of mine that I'm just developing in my head just this minute because we're talking about it in these terms, is that somehow the bitter root judgment is that instead of being 
a child of God with an immortal soul who can live forever and have a resurrected body one day in heaven, that we think of ourselves as somehow um, just um, as if we were only frail bodies contingent upon every illness and especially on a plague, see? So if we were more like the saints who had such a sense of being children of God and being beloved children of God, I don't think it would worry us so much as it does. No, I, I guess I would agree with that, yeah. You would, you would. Okay, yeah. but let's get back to the book because we wrote the book way before the coronavirus. And what, I, what, what Al taught me throughout working on these sessions was that I could only have the kind of spiritual joy that he has if I would totally accept the permissive will of God. And since I knew, now first let me make a distinction between the permissive and the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God, this is not mine, this is from all of the allergies, the perfect will of God was Eden. It wasn't a world full of terrible wounds and death. It was Eden. That was the perfect will of God. But since we used our free will to spin and distance ourselves from him, and we had all these consequences of that in the fallen world, okay, he permits these bad things to happen to us, and bad things to happen in the world because that draws us out of this very um, this very flawed world into the longing for heaven and the longing for union with him. So we have in the Easter liturgy this famous words, oh, happy fault, which brought in such a savior. So because of uh, because of the world falling and needing a savior of the world, we get to go to a place that's far better even than Eden because Eden was a place of great joy, but it wasn't a place of the type of union with God that we will have in heaven. So with that all in the background, the question is, um, how can we get closer to God so that when we have something we fear will happen to us that God is permitting, that God is permitting, say, that my spouse divorced me. That's not in my case, but it's very common. My spouse may divorce me or did divorce me, or um, one of my children will die, which happens to me. But we have this fear of something, and... We say, God, I, I can't stand it. You can't let this happen to me because I'll go crazy if you let this happen to me. I can't. It's unbearable yeah. to me. We say that in our heads, say. Okay. Yeah, and, so how do, and, you teach, how do you teach, Al? How do you teach people? And you could use your own example of your wife's um, uh, tragic death. How do you how do you get to accept God's will in such, permissive will in such a way that you don't have to be miserable and anxious all the time? Sure. Uh, in the context of the book, uh, it, it, it's a, the uh, spiritual direction was accomplished in two steps. The first was to find that bitter root judgment and try to heal the person in this case you of um, of that bitter root judgment, so that you, if you re once you recognize it, you can work against it. That's the first step. But beyond that, uh, that the the, next, the the step that really takes you toward uh, spiritual joy is called detachment, and that's not an easy thing to understand. So I'll well, I'll see what I can do to uh, to explain that detachment. Well, let me step one further, one step further back. Uh, in Scripture, uh, Jesus, before his ministry starts, goes out into the desert, and he's tempted three times. 
those are the temptations of Christ, and uh, he rejected those three um, as a as a model for his life. The three are power, wealth, and the easy life. Those are the three temptations in modern terms. Detachment really does not mean that you must live without any of those, without any power, without wealth, you know, just just get rid of all of it. What detachment means is it's a question of priorities. The fourth option, which Christ chose, was the will of the Father. Whatever God wants is what I want. That was his choice. It didn't mean he had to totally uh, step away from power, wealth, and the easy life. He had a little bit of each of those, but his his priority always was, what does the Father want from me now? And you see that throughout the uh, the New Testament. Uh, and that is the model that we need to imitate. We can have power. Politicians have power. We can have wealth. There are people, uh, philanthropists with a great amount of wealth. Or we can have the easy life if that's what we want. But that has to be second to the will of God. If you well, if you uh, if you discover the will of God, pardon? Oh yeah, let's look at an example. So take the example of your beloved wife Jeannie, and you could read about this. He has beautiful. Al wrote a beautiful book about his life, and his wife was a very holy woman who led prayer groups, uh, Catholic charismatics, and I was in her prayer groups, and I know what a wonderful woman she was. Okay, and he, she helped bring him into the church from being an atheist originally. You can read about these things in different books of his, um, of, published by um, Anru Books. So if you read about his story, you will see, okay, how much his wife meant to him. So now here's his wife dying of um, complications of Alzheimer's, and... How did you get through, I mean, she was part of your wealth, she was part of you, and you thought you had power to protect her, and she was part of the ease and joy of your life. And how were you able to accept God's permissive will? Well, I I uh, accepted her illness as it was, and I think she did, and I know she did too, once she realized what the situation was, and we just lived one day at a time doing the best the two of us could do. Um, she didn't exhibit any fear all the way to the end. Uh, in fact, uh, oh, two, two weeks before she died, I guess, when she was actually in the hospital, I remember her saying to the doctor, and I was there when she said it, she just kept saying, I just want to see Jesus. She was looking forward, not backward. And she did that all the way to the last day. I just want to see Jesus. Uh, that was an expression of her lifetime commitment to uh, to the faith. And uh, I never did see any Im- indication of fear in her at all. And uh, now, she thinking, suffered. For, she thinking suffered thinking for four you years. Can, you can read all about this in the book. What is the book called again? Jeannie's Black Shoes. Oh, um, St. Jeannie's Shiny Black Shoes. Okay, so that's a book of tribute to what this woman was like, but I think that probably contributed to you saying that the doctors doctors and nurses were amazed that you were accepting this so well and weren't filled with um, fear and anger about it. Yeah, that surprised me too. Actually, uh, you know, she's down the hall dying, and uh, and the hospice lady that was leading their team said, "Why do you seem so happy?" They were they you know they were afraid that I was happy that she was dying and I was getting rid of her. That had nothing to do with it. I was totally joyful because she had was completing out completing a uh, holy life. And uh, I knew where she was going next. <laughs> At least I thought so. And uh, and I was joyful for her in her successful life. And 
joyful that uh, I could be there to help her as long as, as she was alive. Um, it, it, but it was it was more than that. It was uh, the um, St. Thomas Aquinas writing about um, charity, unconditional charity, uh, mentions that the product of charity is joy. And and uh, she and I, in our last years, had lived at that level of unconditional charity, in other words, unconditional love, between the two of us and, and with everyone else, uh, always in the in the mode of uh, of uh, altruistic charity and we had been successful in that and it turns out i didn't know to expect this but the lord at the time of her death the lord or just before the lord gave me the grace of constant joy and that's why i could write the book that we just wrote the subtitle is the road to spiritual joy. That is a gift of God for those who are totally obedient to him. And my wife okay, and I had been totally obedient. Okay, totally obedient. totally obedient. Most people who will read this book or who are listening, most of them are people who are um, obedient to God's commandments, obedient to the church, the teachings of the church. Most of the people reading this so what is this other obedience that you're talking about? I would, I would, as I went through this process and began to become less anxious as a result, I would say the thing is, was I obedient to the idea, whatever God wants to do with the rest of my life, I will accept it. I will not be always scheming to avoid every possible suffering. See, my, my tendency would be to anxiously scheme all the time <laughs> about how to avoid all different evils. So if I, how could I, how could I um, insist that God do a miracle to heal my daughter of this lymphoma. And as a matter of fact, after six years, she is healed of that lymphoma, but I only found that out two days ago. So, okay, so all these years of being anxious, in effect, I was saying to God, if you don't heal her, then you're not going to save her, and I'm never going to see her again, and all this kind of thing, versus, um, what God said in my heart as I was struggling with this is, Rhonda, you didn't create her, I did. You can't save her, I can. <laughs> See, so now how do you build up this kind of trust in God's providence? Is it seems to me it has to do with the way we pray that even though I pray a whole lot, I'm a dedicated widow consecrated to Jesus and I go to daily mass and I pray the rosary and I have quiet prayer and I pray liturgy of the hours and mercy chaplet and many, many things. In the, especially in the quiet time or of holy mass, do I completely surrender myself to God the Father in such a way that I trust that whatever he permits is not going to be ultimately tragic, see, for me mm -hmm. or for the people I love. And that is a different, it's a different depth of prayer and relationship to God than all the things I was praying before, even though I have a very good prayer life, I would say, for years and years and years, very, very close to God in prayer. But it always has to go deeper because Teresa of Avila says God alone is enough. So if God alone is enough, nothing can shatter me. I'm what, what would I be afraid of? Because God, I'm not going to lose. <laughs> See? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the surprises that uh, happened uh, in our work together uh, surprised you was the realization that you were totally obedient to God in terms of 
the scriptural lessons and in terms of um, your day-to-day progress, but your future, and this was a great source of your anxiety as well, you held the future to yourself. You were constantly trying to control your your future uh, without any trust in God as to what your future time life would be. Uh, and that is why you wound up scheming all kinds of, of uh, uh, ways to avoid uh, um, a difficult or later life. Uh, you were trying to control. In fact, as I wrote in the book, I said, uh, you know, you, you follow the Holy Spirit, but in terms of your future, you ask the Holy Spirit to sit in the back seat while you drive through the maze of the vineyard looking for the back gate. <laughs> the, uh, if you remember that. Uh, the point being that uh, you you were obedient up to the point of now, as it is now passed along, but you were constantly trying to control your own future and uh, with no trust at all in God. Uh, you know, you might say you had trust, but uh, your you uh, your actions uh, belied the fact, and uh, that was part of your anxiety problem because in being uncertain of your future and not trusting in your future, you were constantly scheming all kinds of solutions that were totally impractical, and that just added to your anxiety. Early in early on, I told you you were creating your anxiety yourself. And you got mad at me when I said that, <laughs> but, uh, but but much later, much much later, you finally realized that I was absolutely right. You were causing your own anxiety uh, out of the bitter roots judgment, which was the source, uh, namely this fear and and uh, assumption of being rejected. You were trying to control your futures yourself, and that was the that was where all the anxiety was coming from. Oh, okay, now, if any of this that you're listening to, if you identify at all with anything that I said about my anxiety or Al said about my anxiety, you would be, do very well to get hold of our book published by Anru Books as the same organization that sponsors this radio show. So if you just put in, I, if you just go into the en route part of this this whole website um, and put in escaping anxiety along the road to spiritual joy or just put in my name, Rhonda Chervin, or Al Hughes' name, Al, Albert E. Hughes, you can find this book and... Um, it could help you greatly. There are people I've given it to, including um, pastoral counselors who said that they thought it was a wonderful book, very, very helpful. So um, we want to, um, I want to close this um, radio program with a prayer, and you could add to it, Al. Um, oh, well, Before you do that, I'd like to add a point or two. Yeah, yeah, um, go Yeah, uh, I think it was about two months ago you called me. You were very excited. You had received a an email, a long email, you said, from a woman who had read the book, had followed the, the thinking of the book, and had actually cured herself of anxiety. And, uh, and I was quite glad to hear that, too, because it, uh, it, the book, Turns out to be more than just a, a record of what we did, but a uh, it it uh, it gives you the path truly gives you the path or the road to spiritual joy out of a uh, out of a uh, situation of great anxiety. It, it it you know it can whether you can find a spiritual director or not uh, by following the. Uh, the, the thought patterns of the book, you can actually heal yourself. Well, okay. At the end of the book, uh, Al Hughes has a section about spiritual direction, and very few priests have time for spiritual direction. Some do, but unfortunately most don't. Uh, but you can have spiritual friends, and a spiritual friend, I think we should always have a spiritual friend who we think is further along the road than we are, 
we could run things by who will give us good advice. And um, so, um, but of course, reading very good books about these very subjects, about these syndromes that we have, is of course a way that God can break through our just giving up, just saying, well, I'm always going to be an anxious person. I can't I just offer it up. But, you know, we shouldn't be that, we're not supposed to be anxious. Perfect love casts out fear, the scripture says. So, dear God, please send your perfect love to cast out the fear that is in many of our hearts. Please cast out that fear. And Mother Mary, so trusting in the midst of such a um, unusual, fearful life that you went through, but ultimately so victorious, please help each of us and guardian angels help us. Amen. Amen. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.